All right, in today's episode, we're going to talk about why MAPS training programs has been consistently ranked as the most effective training programs out there. <laughs> I How's like that. that. Yeah. I like that better. I like All that right. better. It's much better. All right. So, <laughs> so smart people. I guess we're going to talk about, I guess, the kind of how it all started and what makes uh, the MAPS programs what they are. Because we have now, we've got tens and thousands of, of people who've followed the programs and um, there's a lot of, we, we talked about this early on, but we've been on air now almost at eight years. So we really haven't talked about kind of the deal. Behind well, is it, I mean, how is this for you right now? You and Doug, right? How, to think about this, that literally right about 10 years ago, yeah. you and him, you were training him. You were working on writing this up. He was testing probably some of the philosophy around it. And you were applying some of the things that you were coming up with to your clients at the time. Have you wrapped your brain around that? That's it's 10 year anniversary right now. It's been, it's yeah, man. It's pretty cool. It went by fast, huh, Doug? <laughs> Too fast. It went by super fast. Does it um, feel like that long ago? Like both. It feels like a long time ago. You know why it feels like a long, when I see old videos and I go, oh, yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, but it also feels like it, it went by and like, like a, it's like having a kid, like your kid grows up and, and you're like, oh my God, where'd the time go? It went by so fast. But so back then I had um, a wellness studio. So we did personal training and I had massage therapists there, acupuncturists, um, people that help with nutrition, all that stuff. And that's when Doug came in and Doug uh, hired me um, as his trainer. And now leading up to that point, I had been training people for probably 12 years or so. So I'd been doing it for over a decade. And I was always a student, you know, like you guys, right? A student of of a fitness, right? Learning about how things did, in the, you know, people did things in the past and what works and what doesn't work. Anyhow, I started training Doug and Doug had a lot of experience with exercise. So he was by no means a beginner. He had been working out for a long time. He'd follow bodybuilding routines and, you know, he was a bit of a student of the game as well. Came to me because he was referred to me by his chiropractor and through training Doug, he saw like this really rapid transformation. And how long, into our, I guess our relationship was it that you approached me? I wish I could remember the exact amount of time, but uh, I would say within the first year, year and a half. Yeah. Um, oh, so you guys have been training for a while. For a while. Yeah. Yeah. So I basically, I, I took some time to see what was actually going to happen as far as the workouts were concerned. Right. And I'm, sure, response you're, I'm and, sure you were skeptical because of well, your experience of lifting over the last, what, two days or previous two decades? Yes. So I, yeah, so I had experience working out. Of course, I'd had a lot of frustrations working out over the years. And uh, the philosophy that Sal was putting forth was certainly counter to a lot of the things I'd read in the bustle and fitness magazines. But again, my experience was such that I had tried all kinds of different things and I hadn't seen the success I wanted. And I was very open to a different approach or different philosophy, because obviously if what you're doing is not working, something's got to change. And so I uh, just, you know, I stood back, uh, just went through the the workouts with Sal and uh, saw the benefits. And little by little, I started thinking, well, you know, this is something that we should be sharing with other mm -hmm. people because it's been game changing for me. Why shouldn't we get this out there? Because most of the information I'd been seeing had been really kind of counter to what Sal was putting out there. How many weeks uh, did it, were you into the program before you kind of had that epiphany and were like, wow, this is different, but also it's super effective in comparison to what I've done before? Well, even during the first month, I started seeing some real changes. So I started out and I gained a lot of strength. I started putting on size and I go, okay, something, something's working here. So now you're committed. I mean, yeah, I'm committed. And I'd paid for, I think, 10 sessions originally. It was your first package, yeah. And then he had another package, which was 40 sessions. So I- Nice bump sale, so. <laughs> very nice, yeah. So I ponied packages. up the money for that, uh, which was not a, it was not cheap. No. Now he was expensive. Yeah. Uh, but I figured, well, you know, once I'm into it, I want to get the benefits. So I'm going to go all in. And so I did that. And then I actually, I think I purchased that package at least once or twice after that as well. Yeah. But sometime, I think, during that, towards the end of that first package, the 40s uh, mm -hmm. package, I said, you know, I really want to do something with this guy. So yeah. be honest. All these years now we've been together, you pretty much control most of our money. Have you skimmed most of that money back that you <laughs> gave to Yeah, Sal? pretty much. Yeah. Little yeah. by little. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's that oh, first 10 back.
All right, everybody, today's giveaway is MAPS Anabolic. Uh, that was the first MAPS program, and it's uh, quite fitting because today's episode, we talk about the fact that it's the 10-year anniversary of MAPS. Also, stay tuned. We got something cool coming out. Not going to tell you much more. It's going to be a surprise. Anyway, if you want to win free access to MAPS Anabolic, uh, here's what you do. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Uh, subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If you do all of those things and we declare you the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section that you won. Also, we have a 50% off sale going on right now. Three programs on sale. MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, and MAPS Hit. All 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. I remember the first uh, time I really had to convince. So Doug was like the perfect client. So you guys have known this. I'm sure you've experienced this. You have that one client that, yeah. you know, at first they're skeptical, but then you show them and then they're like, okay, cool. Let's just like, I'll, I'll go along and follow, you know, what you say. And then it becomes a great relationship. They get great results. Yeah. So he was like the perfect client in that sense. And the first thing I had to convince Doug of was to only work out twice a week. You know, that, in fact, when he hired me after when, when he was hiring me, he wanted to come four days a week. So him and I started talking, he already bought the training and he wanted to do like three or four days a week. And I said, no, 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 we're going to do two days a week to start with. And, um, he, I had to convince him of it, but you know, within a few weeks he knew, okay, this is, you know, this is working. Um, that speaks to your integrity too. Cause Justin would have sold him on the four times a week, <laughs> and just, you know, walked with him on the other two days or something yeah. like that. There, yeah. <laughs> and I truly year. found it hard to believe that twice a week was going to do the trick. Yeah. I really did. But, I looked at Sal, I looked at myself and I go, well, this guy might know something, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> but he so got, I trusted he, the process. And he got great, obviously he got great results uh, from it, but, um, towards the God, towards probably that second or third package that you had done with me, Doug came to me and he says, you know, Sal, he goes, um, I have some internet marketing experience. Uh, he wasn't an internet marketer. He was, he sold, uh, insurance, but he says, I have some experience. If you ever want to put something together, that you want to, that we, you know, we can sell online. He goes, I'll, I'll do that with you. And I had nothing at that point. I didn't really have an idea of what to sell. Uh, I'd always thought about writing a book, but I thought, you know, what, the, what would that look like, you know, digitally or whatever. And so I took him, what he said, and it just kind of stayed in the back of my mind. And I went home and it was probably, this is like 2012, 2011, yeah. 2013 around there. What time is this? Like yeah. I'd say this was either at the end of 2012 or the beginning of 2013. Okay. Yeah. Now, now consider up until this point, at this point, I had already, dis I had already learned a, a, a lot about training and had figured out that a lot of the stuff that I thought was effective wasn't. And, you know, I, I'd do things like I had, you know, probably a few years before this, I really got into learning about how, how athletes trained before steroids even became a thing, how before, you know, supplements became a thing. Um, and this was something that was of interest to me because, um, I knew that anabolic steroids changed how the body responded to exercise. So I said, you know, back in the day before that even existed, they had to train the way that my clients trained, the way that I was training naturally. And there has to be, uh, if they train differently, then it's because they were natural. So let me see what they did. And when I look back, there were so many different things that they did that people didn't do anymore. So up until this point, I had kind of figured some of that stuff out. But anyway, he came up to me and said, hey, if you have an idea, um, I'd love to work with you on it. We could sell it online. And it was probably a week later. And I went home uh, that night, maybe a week later. I was up late reading. And I would do this sometimes. Sometimes I'd stay up late and I'd read whatever. You, know, you guys know I'll get into something and I'll just start you know, kind of going crazy on it. And I was reading the New England Journal of Medicine. And there was a study that I've quoted many times on the podcast on – they, it was a really interesting study. They took groups of men and they compared each group of men to each other on muscle building. And the groups were broken up into uh, natural with strength training, uh, anabolic steroids with weight training, and then anabolic steroids, no weight training, so just sedentary, and then uh, just sedentary. Mm -hmm. So it was sedentary, sedentary with steroids, steroids and training, and then training naturally. And the results of that blew me away because I did not expect. Well, to one see in particular, right? Cause you obviously, you knew that the steroids and working out was going to be the biggest. Yeah, of course. Right? Like I'm like, well, they're going to build the most it's muscle. It's a unique group. study, by the way. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, the one that blew me away, cause I would have thought second place would have been the natural lifting group. Mm -hmm. So the group that was natural lifting, 
they've got to build uh, the second most amount of muscle. But it wasn't. It was the steroid group that didn't lift weights. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a short study. I think it was, I don't know, I want to say 16 weeks. But in that 16-week period, the steroid group that didn't lift built a little bit more muscle than the natural group that lifted. And I thought, this is insane. The first thought I had was, wow, steroids are really powerful. Yeah. But then the what, what came to me after that, and I was literally up till uh, 3 a.m. thinking about this, uh, and this is when I started writing out um, the first MAPS program, is I said, you know, what's crazy about this isn't the fact that the steroid group that didn't lift built the most muscle. It's that my previous ideas of how we built muscle is not complete. Mm -hmm. So the thought process then was in order to build muscle, you damage the muscle with exercise, the body heals and then adapts. Okay? Therefore, to that point, the thought process, I think for all of us at that point in our lives was like, okay, the more damage I do, the better off I'm going to be. Cause then I have yeah. a louder muscle you building signal, equate right? your healing to whatever damage you do. Yeah, there was that, but there was also that I had completely ignored that there could be potentially any other muscle building signals. Yeah. It was damage and that was it. There's yeah. no other signals that send the body that the body receives that says build muscle. Well, in this study, clearly there was no damage. There was a hormonal signal, which was the steroids, right? They gave them mm -hmm. testosterone. So I thought to myself, and this is why I was up till two or three a.m. that night. I thought, I wonder what other signals tell the body to build muscle that have nothing to do with damage. Yeah. Like what other signaling systems? tell the body to build muscle. So then I was on the internet going crazy and thinking of experience, uh, my experiences with clients and family members. One that popped up immediately was, and again, I've talked about this before, uh, probably at least a hundred times on the show, is I had, you know, I have a lot of blue collar workers in my family. I have plumbers and, um, you know, uh, tile setters, construction mail workers, uh, mail carriers, and none of them work out but they all had muscular body parts that correlated or corresponded to the activity that they did. So like the male carriers in my family all had these really muscular forms, male, excuse me, uh, calves, male and female, all had really muscular calves. And the plumbers in my family, these muscular forms, you know? And I'm like, they're not, when you're a plumber or uh, a mechanic or a male carrier, you might cause a little muscle damage at first, but these people have been doing it for 20, 30 years, you know, they're all yeah. in the fifties and sixties, that damage stops. They're, it's not like they're walking more or cranking on things that are harder. After the first couple months, the body's adapted and that's it. Why the heck are these male carriers calves? I mean, literally their calves look like, uh, like bodybuilder calves or like I have an uncle whose forearms were like this uh, and he was a mechanic and I thought, or plumber. And I thought the damage stopped. What is telling these body parts to continue to grow? And I'm like, there, there's still some signaling going on, mm -hmm. even though there's no damage. Even though there's no damage, there's some signaling going on. So that was like yeah. one like clue that I, that I had. Yes. Exactly. So you basically had your um, slip in the shower flex capacitor moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was like signals. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> muscle thinking, signal. So I'm thinking all this different stuff. So I'm like, okay, there's damage. That's a real one. Then there's this like low level, uh, frequent signaling Stimulus. system, yeah. you know, which I ended up, you know, figuring out it's kind of like mechanical signaling. Then there's the pump. The pump can actually induce muscle growth itself. So there's another one. So then I thought, I'm going to create a program that utilizes all these different signaling systems and puts them together in a way to where the body's constantly getting a signal to build muscle because the, the the challenge with damage is always recovery. You can only damage so much. And then the the limiting factor is otherwise if you know if recovery wasn't an issue, I could just go work out for, you know, 6 hours in a row and beat the crap out of myself and I'd get better results. And so that's how literally the first Mo maps program was created. And I remember that the the day after that Doug comes in to train with me and I'm all tired cuz I was up all night and I'm like I got something, dude. I said, I wrote up a program and uh, we tested it. I had clients test it. And then. And yeah. How it. long uh, after writing it, testing it with Doug, implementing it with other, because this is about the same time when you and I start to start to talk too. 
because you had already kind of tested it on clients. In fact, you guys started to create some of the promo stuff on it. Yeah. Like how long was that? Like applying it to the other, the trainers starting to create the, the promo stuff on it? Months. It was probably, uh, I would say like a five or six month period because Doug was first and Doug had already been working out with me in a similar way, but then I had him apply things like trigger sessions and, um, you know, we did a little bit more phasing um, and then I had a client, Jim, good friend of mine. He tested it. Then I had um, Homera, you know her. She used to work for uh -huh. for both of us. Yeah. Uh, I had all kinds of different friends test it, experienced, beginner. Mm -hmm. um, and I had them report back, you know, tell me what you feel, what you notice. And everybody was, you know, reporting back like, wow, this is really crazy. Like I'm getting um, really good results. This is wild. And, um, that's then Doug, um, started putting together now at the time, I didn't know, I knew nothing of internet marketing sales. I had no idea you could put a program online, do all that stuff. And Doug's like, yeah, we're going to put you on video. You're going to talk to a camera, do the whole thing. I'm like, oh yeah, my I'm God. surprised you guys didn't go the DVD route at that yeah. point, right? <laughs> that was kind of like, you know, almost in that era. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't a lot of programs out in that era too. It was like. You know, you had like the infomercials and you had a bit of beach body and maybe some like bodybuilder programs like I'd seen, but not a whole lot of like quality fitness programs. Out no. Well, no, you know, when he tells this story, one of the things that, you know, I try and challenge myself to think like, man, I wonder if you would have sent me over when Doug sent over that pro when you sent over the promo video that Doug made, if that would have been hyping up like a you know a, a typical online type of program yeah like and it and it didn't have the philosophy like what was that that was your guys' uh anabolic signaling program you know which one i'm talking about right oh, yeah, that, yeah that, it's that, like a 30 minute the, video the yeah, switch yeah, or whatever yeah the muscle switch yeah. so you got to share a clip of that for this this podcast because oh god I when like I, so, when so I, young in that video. yeah, but when you sent it over to Beautiful. me, originally you just wanted my opinion on yeah. it. Like, Hey, what do you think of this promo video? And what I, what I'm the exercise that I, I try and do with myself regarding this is, you know, would a mind pump have happened had it not aligned with what at the same time was happening in my life as far as programming? Because for most of my lifting career and training career, teaching other people, I fell in the trap of creative workouts mm -hmm. and, you know, you, like just hammering the clients and volume and intensity. And I was very much so it, like in that space for yeah. almost a decade. And I was on my way out of that. Like I had started to finally realize like this was not the answer. One, I had applied that same philosophy you did to Doug to myself, like reducing the amount of, and then saw I got bigger than mm -hmm. I ever got. And I thought, oh, this is wild. Like more doesn't always mean more results. And I was starting to train my clients in these full body routines and really simplify the programming. And so I was just coming into that, like really fresh into that for the last, like say six months of my training career. And when I saw that pro, that is what hit home for me was like, yeah, it was very counter to the trends. Yes. Yeah. That's, this is not trendy. This is the opposite of what, and it's right in line with what took me my, yeah. you know, at this point, my entire career to figure out. And that's what made me pick the phone up and go, let's meet. Yeah. I Otherwise I would have just given you like, Oh yeah, cool, bro. Yeah. I yeah. like it. You know, yeah. it's neat, but it video it, looks good, but it, 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 it prompted me to like, Hey, let's meet. We need to all get together and talk because I don't, there's nothing out there that I see that is presenting this message this way. And it took, and I'm in the space and it took me 10 years to get here. Mm -hmm. So imagine how many people that we could really help by putting this out there. Well, like, I thought the same thing. Well, in my career too was like, uh, even after I left 24 and kind of went and did things on my own, um, I was still kind of like experimenting with a lot of the trends in the fitness industry and like trying to train people with all this functional training and, you know, single arm, single leg stuff and all this nonsense. And, uh, and then I, I made it to the gym where I, I was around really high level trainers and, and sports specific type trainers. And so it just really kind of brought things right back to the basics. Like, here's what, you know, you've known this before, but you just rush your clients through all of this. And this is really the meat of what we need to focus on. And that had, that program had a lot of that in it. Uh, in terms of like just focusing on how to build muscle. Well, the for, beauty is in the simplicity of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, you know, and you gotta, I mean, you gotta kind of go back and, and, and think about why training got to that point, because at that point we're talking 10, 10 plus years ago, the most common strength training programs were like these body parts split one body part a day, high volume type of deal, beat the crap out of yourself 
50 different angles, you know, and whatever. And you got to think to yourself, like, why, why that happened? It's not that those don't work. They do, but a lot of the information on how to build muscle and train with weights had been disseminated from the bodybuilding space. And bodybuilders for decades were, first off, bodybuilders are at that level, uh, have very little in common with the average person. They just genetically, they're just very different. They're, it's like being seven feet tall. They're just genetically gifted. So what does that mean? That means that when they send a muscle building signal to their body, the average person, that signal may last 24 to 48 hours. For these people, that signal lasts a week or two, okay? Because they're just, their body's primed to build muscle. Then on top of it, they're all pharmaceutically enhanced. And that means they have this constant loud hormonal signal that's going on in their body all the time. And so they're the ones that are telling people how to work out. The problem is the average person is nothing in common with this person genetically and isn't pharmaceutically enhanced. And they're trying to follow these routines and they're not working. Now, if you go back at the turn of the century, you know, early 1900s, late 1800s, these, I mean, you're talking about tremendous feats of strength from these strong men and strong women, right? And they were muscular and they were doing crazy things. And if you look at their training, they all trained full body. They all trained three days a week. Mm -hmm. They all trained in a similar way. And, and people, it's funny, when we look back, we tend to think people are stupid. So we look back, oh, they didn't know anything back then. No, 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 they were wise. They did what worked. And by the way, the only way they made money back then was they, they didn't have social media. They couldn't promote themselves any other way than going and challenging other strong men on stage. This is how they made money. So you had to put up or shut up. Then you also look at the studies on uh, strength sports like Olympic weightlifting. Olympic weightlifting has more science put into it than bodybuilding does because it's been funded by countries. It's, you know, the Soviet Union for a long time. This is the way that they showed their power. And so you look at the science there and there, there's a lot of science there that didn't match what we were being told, you know, worked. So there's a lot of the information there. And then the other thing is this, is that, look, you, you guys are both really good trainers, really, really good trainers. What made you guys good? You did it for a long time and you cared. Because if you care about your clients and you do it long enough, eventually, I don't care how hard-headed you are, how big your ego is, eventually you, you ask yourself the same question. Why isn't this working? Yeah. Why am I not seeing results on my clients? Let me try this. Let me try that. So it's like all these different roads, they all go to the truth. That's why when yeah. you saw what I it sent, Adam- through it all to get that's, the truth. Yeah. So why, that's why when you guys saw what I sent, it wasn't like- yeah. It wasn't like new information. It was like, that's what I'm figuring well, out it, too. Well, it was- in my opinion, it was the money and the marketing that bastardized the fitness industry. Because can you imagine opening up a, a Flex magazine 20, 15, 20 years ago and, you know, seeing, you know, Ronnie Coleman or Arnold in the middle of it like that and and their workout routine was as boring as Maps Anabolic? Yeah. Like it would not sell anything. What sold was, you know, the tricep bicep blaster workout with yeah. cluster sets and drop sets and pyramids and this mm -hmm. unique exercise hanging upside down. And that was what sold magazines. That's what grabbed attention. Yeah. And if you had the the shit that works really well, that is that everybody's known about for a hundred years, it wouldn't sell. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be popular. It wouldn't be new. It wouldn't be unique, which by the way, is the same trap that all the trainers inside the gyms fell into. We fell in the same trap on, you know, selling our clients on buying more training from us. If I told my clients, hey, we need a squat, overhead press, bench press, deadlift, that's basically what we're going to do for the next six months to a year or so, and I'm going to get you great results, I wouldn't have been able to resign my clients. Instead, it was next week, I'm going to show you something yeah. new you've never done before. Yeah, or down. wait till you feel this workout I got coming, you know? And on the other side of that, you brought up the, the bodybuilding side. But in Justin's world, I think was simultaneously the the um, birth of, you know, sports performance, plyometric stability training, functional. functional type shit was all coming on the scene hard. Yep. And then you got the hardcore bodybuilding scene. And so the two of them, and again, money and marketing, what was cool in the, the, the money and the marketing side on that? Like, oh man, seeing somebody jump and stabilize on one leg and jump through all these weird hoops and spin yeah. and twist and like balance on a stability ball with a squat bar, you know, on yeah. your back, like that stuff became so attractive to people and trainers and IE clients that it dominated the space. And we all fell for, we all fell right into it. Dude. I'm guilty 
of going down the same path in pursuit of filling my client book up instead of focusing on what was really giving my clients yeah, results. I mean, we all remember people doing tricep press downs while standing on Dyna discs. You know? <laughs> like, what, so what, 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 what were people I doing? I don't know what we were doing. It, yeah, everything was, you know, balancing and whatever. And that's when the functional, you know, when it got crazy in that way. Um, it, and what happens is you end up ignoring what actually produces the best results. Instead, you're like entertaining your clients with what's new and what's different or reinforcing the terrible idea that the more sore you get, the more painful this is, the more you feel like you're going to throw up. Mm -hmm. That means we're doing something good. And especially when a client comes to you because they hate themselves. It's actually quite therapeutic. Like, oh, I hate, I'm so fat. I can't stand myself. And then you train them to the point where they feel like they're going to throw up and it's cathartic. Yeah, that's what I get. That's what I deserve. I need to be beat up. You know, how many times you get a client come up to oh. you and say, oh, I, I need a, I, why do you want to hire a trainer? Because I need someone to whip me into shape. Yeah. yeah. Like, what? <laughs> I, I won't train myself that hard if yeah, I don't. Yeah, so, well, I just don't have the discipline. Yeah, dude. <laughs> so, like, oh, great. Absolutely. Another thing that is that now, and it's funny too, because we're talking, you know, this was over a decade ago. Now it's almost like this is silly to even say, but this wasn't silly back then. Just 10 years ago, it wasn't silly to say that all rep ranges build muscle. You got into debates and arguments uh, with people. It was this rep range is the best. No, that rep range is the best. And I just looked at things and said, okay, look, power lifters are big and strong. If low rep ranges don't build muscle, why the hell do power lifters look the way they do? And then I said, high rep ranges build mm -hmm. muscle too. I know bodybuilders that train in the 20 rep range. Uh, again, marketing. Yeah. It was it's too nuanced to say that. It's much easier on a sales funnel or an infomercial to say these reps are for this. These reps are for that, you yeah. know, or this these reps are for this body type. It's so much easier to sell that idea than to say something as vague as all rep ranges build yeah, yeah. muscle and lose body fat. Yeah. Okay, and well then which ones am I supposed to, to use the muscle? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Then you can get away with all of them at once. Yeah, or or how about this? Like, um, okay, uh, here's two strength athletes, uh, bodybuilders, beat the crap out of a muscle, leave it alone for a week so it can grow. Olympic weightlifters, practice these movements every day, the same movements every single day. How the heck can those both coincide? You got hyper-frequent Olympic lifters mm -hmm. who practice movements on a daily basis for hours, okay? Olympic weightlifters will train two or three times in a day doing practicing snatches and cleans. And you got bodybuilders over here who are like, I only do curls on Tuesday, and I beat the crap out of my biceps and I leave them alone for the whole week. Like, could it be, could it be possible? This is, this is what would go through my head. Could it be possible that there's truth in both of them? And that if we understood that there's truth in both of them, could we use what's true in a way to where the average person could utilize the benefits of both? And the answer, of course, is yes. Yes, there is truth in both of them. And so this is what, you know, what I started to apply yeah. uh, with clients and with myself. And this is what you guys figured out on your own. Because like well, I said, look, you train people long enough, you're going to figure this out. It was funny because even in the world that I was sort of training out of, I was getting made fun of for doing bench press and squats because of all of the functional split stance movements. Like there was this whole movement on um, basically like Bulgarian sports squats, split squats or, um, uh, lunges. And that was like, you know, how you would, you would basically load that as heavy as you could. And that was the best way to do that for athletes because of the fact that you're primarily on the field are going to be in a split stance. And so this whole philosophy around it, which I mean, you can make an argument, but for me, it was always, I want to build and establish that fundamental strength. And I want to, I can load it the most effective way with a barbell. I get strongest doing that, but then I also move out of that and do both. And mm. so it's like, it's not one or the other. It's, it's both. Well, the truth yeah. is that, you know, when you, and it's funny, cause when we get like a, a trainer who's been a trainer for a really long time and they hear some of the maps philosophy or hear the way we talk about exercise, they're never impressed. Cause like, Oh yeah, I know that's obvious. Know that that's, yeah. but nobody has been promoting, wasn't promoting yeah. that at least not back then. Nobody's right? applied, ten, nobody ten, applied it 10 years ago. It was, it, it's always been known, especially if you'd been a trainer for an extended period of time, you knew that this is the nuts and bolts of training, but nobody was applying it mm -hmm. because it wasn't what sold. I mean, at the end of the day, most all trainers, whether you are online, virtually, or in person, 
have to, you know, feed their families and have a business and keep clients coming in. And that wasn't what was best to keep clients coming. That's the truth. Now, the reality of that is that, yes, it is, because if you stick to good programming, you get a greater percentage of oh people, God. way more results. You teach them the fundamentals that they can now carry on forever. And then, then eventually that comes back to you in referrals and the, and the reputation that you have, but it's hard to see that when you're in it, right? When it you're is. in the, when you're in the end of it, in it, and you got monthly goals, I gotta, I gotta sell this much to make this much money. Mm -hmm. And what's a, what's a quick way to do that? Oh, a quick way to do that is what, just like what all the marketers have done, which is sell you on simple, quick ideas that speak to you so I can keep you coming back versus thinking what is probably really best Dude, for these clients. I, I look I, now, I obviously know you guys now, so I know the answer to this, but even before I knew you guys, I could have made this prediction that our careers all fold the same path. Initially, really good at getting clients, selling them training. They stick around for three to six months, you lose them and then you got to get new clients and you're really good at getting new clients. But then what that eventually morphed into as you got good and did exactly what you said, Adam, is clients would stay with you for years. Mm -hmm. I bet you the last five years of your guys' career, you probably cycled through almost no clients. You had the yeah. same clients. They stuck with the you the lifers, whole time. Yeah. But the first five years, you probably trained 100 people yeah. or more because of that idea that you had to show them different things and get them crazy sore and super. So there's a huge myth with trainers, which is, that you need to entertain your client that way or show them weird shit all the time. The reality is no, you, you just need to be able to communicate it well, but train them in the most effective ways possible. They don't go anywhere. Yeah, They stay with you forever and you end up becoming far more uh, successful. Speaking of selling the program, that's where the big challenge was because when-, when, when It's not sexy. <laughs> well, when I wrote it out, so here's what I understood about myself because I was a huge consumer mm. of, of fitness. I knew that- I would buy something if the person explained it to me, did a good job selling it, but also had some kind of perceived authority. So if it was somebody who I was like, oh yeah, that person has got some authority and then they did a good job selling it, I would buy it. Regardless if it looked sexy or not, I would at least consider it. So I'm like, okay, I can explain it well. And that was the video I sent you, Adam, to to review because I knew you had a, a you know really good background and in fitness sales. And so I said, you know, we sent you the sales video so you could give me some, you know, some critique on it. But the other part was authority. That was where the challenge was. I remember Doug and I talked about that and we're like, well, how do we build authority? I'm like, well, the only way I know to build authority in the fitness space is to look more jacked than anybody else. I'm like, that's not going to happen. Like I could get, like I got shredded, but I wasn't like, you put me up against on Instagram or at the time in the magazines, no one's going to look at me twice. I don't look like any of these people. So I said, maybe I'll write a book. Like, how am I going to build this authority? And then we talked about maybe doing a podcast. I thought podcasting would be good because it was long form. Because I, I don't want to use my 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 body to sell anything. I couldn't compete with the you know those people that were out there. Plus, I don't want to do it that way. I wanted to be able to talk and yeah. explain. Only and build fans authority. wasn't created yet. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's when, when, when we got on the phone, Adam, and, and you know, we, we, we met and then it was like, oh yeah, we got to do a podcast because it's long form and, you know, knowing what we know about fitness, it's uh, unfortunately often sold in short form, which includes a picture and a before and after and a couple taglines, mm -hmm. but real fitness, long-term success uh, requires long form. How do I know this? How many times, how long did it tell, take you guys to sell your clients yeah. to make real changes, right? Uh, sometimes years yeah. of training them. Well, to that point, you know, that had a lot to do, obviously, with our strategy of not actually selling the program when it was ready to sell. That's right. I mean, when the podcast had started and we were on episode one, uh, the natural progression, I think, for somebody in this space would have been to promote the program that we had to sell. And we did it. We sought out to go prove to people that we could help them for free and change their lives and make an impact on them by giving them free advice and building that authority, building that trust, building that loyalty. And then we would be able to offer something up to sale. But we had it all, all along. No. But had uh, thank God we had the experience that we had to know that, to know the importance of I need to, we need to help these people. We need to show these people first before we try and convince them, especially since we were trying to convince them to do something that they were going to look at and go like, 
Oh, bench, squat, deadlift, yeah. overhead press. Yeah. Come on, where's the where's the secrets at? You know, where's mm -hmm. the where's the stuff that I didn't know that I'm supposed to do at? And so we had to first build that trust. Yes, through, I mean, think, the show. think of it this way, right? You if you look at you know different pastries. Uh, if I just looked at the ingredients of the different pastries, the ingredients would all look the same. Eggs, flour, sugar, water, whatever. Um, so that's what you see when you look in a, at, a, at, a, at a good program versus a bad program. Except sometimes bad programs have weird ingredients. Otherwise, it's like, oh, that's basic. It's not that. It's how they're put together. That's where programming comes into play. The programming is how much of each, when of each, how to utilize each, and how to put them in the right sequence. Like when you're making mm -hmm. a dish... There's a time when you add the sugar and there's a perfect amount of sugar. You don't just throw it in the beginning, for example. Uh, you would throw it in at a particular time or when you would first, you know, do the garlic or whatever, right? So programming is what makes all those ingredients become a super effective program. So you can't look at a program be like, I know these exercises. Yeah. Oh, look, I, I understand rep ranges, uh, you know. That's not what makes a program effective. What makes it effective, and by the way, I want to be real clear, like, you know, there were a couple programs at the time that were really good, and they had they had gained popularity through forums. At this time, the internet, in the fitness space, forums were becoming a thing. And the, what I thought was cool about mm -hmm. forums was that forums, you had regular people sharing information. There was no marketing. It was all just honesty. And so like starting strength, starting strength had sh nothing. They had no real marketing, no whatever, but it blew up because people were like, Hey, this real basic sounding program is actually, working. no, that was some of the yeah. best, you know, it, it was competing with Beachbody and bodybuilding.com at the time, which was really tough, yeah. which by the way, the success in those two companies was completely around the marketing side. Yes. They would, they would create stuff and then have just a good looking body and attach it to this workout that they would offer just to get free traffic to their website so they can then peddle supplements to them. That was the model yeah. mm -hmm. that they had really, 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 they had done really well. And Beachbody, same thing, marketed to a demographic or a person attached a sexy body to it. And it was all around the marketing and mm -hmm. sales, not on the effectiveness of the program, which there's a reason why those were, you know, one of them was what, a $500 million company, the other one, $4 billion dollars is they were great at marketing not so great as actually which I, I get this all the time right when people ask when they talked to my aunt and uncle last night we were they were you know we got a chance to hang out with all you guys and you know asking origin story type of stuff and they're like did you did you imagine it would ever be like this big and i said you know, it's crazy. And maybe it's a little bit of the narcissism in all of us. 100% <laughs> we did. But the, the truth is this. It's not because I thought I was so great or I think that you guys were. I, what I knew was that there was companies out there like Bodybuilding.com and Beachbody, which were massive companies that that their main nuts and bolts of it was them showing and teaching these exercises and programs that were, to be honest, subpar at best. Yeah. And that some of we, them downright crappy. Yeah. A lot of them down. I was trying to give them some respect because they, you know, there, there is some in bodybuilding.com. There was some, like yes. there was, there was the Lane Norton's in there and stuff like that, right, that right, were right. still pr producing. So I don't want to like completely shit on bodybuilding.com, but for the most part, most of them were, were very subpar or in your point with beach body shit. And what we had to offer, I knew was incredibly, I think what I could have wrote in my twenties would have been better than a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. What we had finally come together at this point and realized was this was <clears throat> extremely valuable. And if we could just get, get to a fraction of those people, I knew that we would be able to help most all you of them. You knew it was going to work. And yeah. I think that's why it was easy to get behind it. And to your point about programming and how, you know, it's all about, uh, you know, the structure of it, the sequencing, the thought behind the actual person experiencing the workout itself. We went through the actual training of it in terms of being with vast numbers of people, taking them through that entire process. And this is where you see a disconnect uh, with uh, industries like producing actors to kind of like portray this stuff. There's mm -hmm. just this massive disconnect from your everyday average consumer. And so to then take sort of that 
blueprint that uh, was constructed in, in anabolic and then, you know, deconstruct it and be like, here's, here's the elements of it. And here's why this works. And then now apply a lot of the concepts of how, you know, I used to train clients, how you used to train yep. clients, how we used to like prepare for a bodybuilding show, how we used to prepare for getting ready for the off season. Like all of these factors now made sense in terms of like how we can take that same uh, elemental blueprint and, and then build upon it. Yeah. The irony of what you said about uh, bodybuilding.com is the forums of bodybuilding.com are what got a lot of the truth out there. You talked about Lane Norton. Yeah. That's how Lane became Lane. It yeah. was in the forums, the free forums of bodybuilding.com uh, starting strength blew up, which is a great, you know, basic yeah. program. It's better than 99% of the, the strength training programs out there were through the forums. Five by five, yeah. so basic, and so whatever training, yeah, came all these through came the forums, yeah. uh, and that's where you would read this kind of stuff. And this is where I would be like, oh, like old time strength training. And here was, you know, here's the here's the, the, the really the gist of it. The gist of it is this, and, and, and it's more complicated than this, but this is really kind of what it boils down to. If you're trying to build muscle and you want all of the benefits of building muscle, this faster metabolism, it's easier to get leaner, sculpt the body, look good or whatever. If you want to build muscle, the muscle building signal needs to be more consistent than the muscle breakdown signal. That's it. Okay. My body needs to be told or want to build muscle more often than it breaks muscle down because you're never stable. Your body's never not doing anything. There's this whole, there's this false belief that you just maintain. No, maintenance is when building and breaking down are balanced. If they're equal, then you don't, you build and you break down. You build and break down, you stay the same. If you want to build, then you have to build more than you break down. If you want to lose muscle and you need to break down more than you build. So once you understand this and you look at studies on muscle protein synthesis, which they can actually measure to a decent degree when your body's building muscles through the, this signal called muscle protein synthesis, and they can test. You do squats. Let's test the, 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 your muscle protein synthesis. It's elevated. How long does it stay elevated for? Oh, wow. Two to three days max. Then it goes down. But wait a minute. The person's still sore. It doesn't matter if they're still sore. Muscle building signal is gone. In fact, two days after it's gone, it starts to go below baseline. This is why people work out, get sore, recover, quote unquote, go back to the gym, do the same thing, but never progress because they're breaking down as much as they're building. So the goal, the idea, the whole, you know, if you really want to, you know, boil it down to the most simple terms, the idea behind maps, the philosophy of maps is, can we keep that muscle building signal elevated more often than the breakdown signal? That's all it is. The, again, the problem was I can send a muscle building signal through damaging muscle, but then recovery gets in the way. I can't just keep doing that. So now, you know, it's up for two or three days. It's going down. Do I beat the crap out of the body real hard? I can't because if I do that, recovery says, no, sorry, we're not even going to build. We're just going to heal. We just got to heal. This is why you'll get sore and your soreness goes away, but you go back to the gym, nothing happens. What happened? Your body just healed. Adaptation is different than healing. Adaptation is above healing. Healing, and then it's like I, if it's like a, I, I, I scratch my hand, my skin heals, and if I do it right, then I'll develop a slight callus, and over time I develop a callus. That's the muscle building process. So the idea with MAPS Anabolic was, which was the first one, and with all the MAPS programs is, can we get the signal to stay throughout the whole week, even though recovery is happening, even though all these other things are happening? And the the answer to that is yes. You definitely can, which is why people then, when we finally launched MAPS Anabolic, which was a year after we did uh, Mind Pump, and the goal with Mind Pump was, like you said, Adam, was can we give people a lot of good information? Can we build authority? Will people believe us? And at that point, if that all works out, then we'll say, here's a program that we have. Now you can buy, because we had the program done. The program was done. It was ready to go. The, the digital part was set up. The videos were done. We did no other work. When we, we had it ready for a year, we didn't launch it for a year because we wanted to prove to our audience, A, that we have integrity, so we're not just trying to sell you something, and B, we know what we're talking about. Do you, do you remember whose idea it was out of you two? Because you actually didn't even use the term that, I, that stuck with me forever and what, why I 
love that video so much because it, it, it really hit home for me when I watched it. It's the scene where you guys show the bear trap and you talk about the muscle recovery trap. You say the muscle breakdown re recovery trap. Yep. And that, that clip of that 20 minute video or whatever like that hit home for me so much that I was like, Oh my God, like how many of my clients have got stuck in this? How long have I got stuck in this, this exact situation? So focused on doing damage to see how much results I can get, yet never letting my body get an, enough recovery, adequate rest, adequate nutrition to actually build and adapt. I was so focused on the damage part. I wasn't focused on the adaptation process. That part of that clip, I remember sticking to me so much. Do you remember if it was a term you came up with and then you came up with the like the visual of it or did you put together a term? You remember how that came together? So Sal came up with the term. I just put the visual behind it. Yeah. 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 So because that was a powerful moment in that for me. So one thing that I learned as a trainer, and I, I know you guys did as well, is you could understand the idea and what works. But what makes you effective as a trainer is you have to say it in a way. Sometimes you have to say it 5,000 different times yep. in different ways. But at some point, you say it in a way to where the client goes, oh, that makes so much sense. Because you could, I could say all day long, like, oh, you know, you damage the muscle and then it needs to heal. But then recover, you know, and that's recovery. But then adaptation happens after that. And the person can hear you and be like, oh, you know, it kind of makes sense. And then, you know, one day, and I use this with clients one day, I said, hey, look. I don't want you to get stuck in the breakdown recovery trap and clients will be like, huh, what's that? I'd be yeah. like, well, it's when you break down a muscle, you let it recover, you break it down again, you let it recover, you break it down again, but no actual muscle growth or changes happens. It's just breakdown, recover, breakdown, recover. And it's a trap. It's a hamster wheel. You're just running on the same hamster wheel. Once I was able to say it that way, it really resonated with clients. So when I told Doug that Doug's like, oh yeah, perfect. And he came up with the picture of the, of the, you know, the bear trap. Yeah. You know, even though I had, I had come to that conclusion and understood that I had never heard it communicated that way. I, that one, I remember that one and the, the amp story I always share that you shared mm -hmm. first, that those two were things that I understood, but still had yet to put like eloquent words to how to explain it. Cause you're always looking as a trainer, you, you can read all the PubMed studies you want and apply all the science. And then the next level to, to being a good trainer first obviously is to acquire that knowledge but then how do you translate that to totally. the average person relatable. so that they have that aha moment and that to me as i'm always seeking that right even to this day i'm always looking for better right. ways to communicate the things that i've learned through my experience and and reading and i had come to that conclusion around how i should train because i was training myself that way now but like still getting that point across to a client so they understood what they were doing i was like oh man Dude, that was a powerful yeah, way to tell me that, that didn't resonate with you as a kid when you know i would do the same thing i'd go hammer my whatever my legs and then I, because it's like, I thought that recovery meant adaptation. That's what I thought. I thought recovery is the adaptation yes. process. I'd hammer my legs and then I'd be so afraid to do anything else. You go lay I, in bed like this. Yeah. <laughs> I'd sit on, the, I'd yeah. sit on the couch yeah. and watch TV and be like, oh, let them grow. Yep. You know? And then, I, you know, and then you, you end up injuring yourself at some point for something else and you have to wear a brace or whatever. You lose muscle hella fast. Like this doesn't make sense. Like just sitting there, that sends a signal to the body that shouldn't, not just not build muscle that it should get rid of muscle. So what's going on here? And and yes, I get sore and the soreness goes away, but then I go work out again and I'm not stronger. It's gotta be something else. And it's because adaptation happens somewhat separately. They tend to happen at the same time similarly, but they're, they're different. And I learned this uh, through even my own training. Like how many times, how many times has this happened to you guys probably later in your career where you you're a little sore but you train the same movement or muscle and then you still build muscle and get stronger, even though the soreness is still kind of there. And then you kind of figure out like, Oh, this is, Hmm. Yeah. Soreness is, uh, is really not what I thought it was. And yeah. recovery might not be necessarily, you know, part of this whole adaptation thing. So, and I really, again, the key is what you do is you look at, and you guys do the same thing in all trainers, any coach or trainer who's been doing this for a long time, this is exactly what you, what you do. So I know it'll resonate is you look at the problem you look at the potential solutions and then you look at the roadblocks with that solution. And you say to yourself, how can I move around those roadblocks? What are ways that I could either train or rep ranges, or how can I utilize intensities that gets around this problem right here? And then eventually what happens, you end up building kind of this formula of ways to do so. And then of course, when you train people, 
it's very individualized. So some, it's a little different from person to person, but you end up with this kind of basic, you know, roadmap, if you will, where, okay, this is how it works. And so that's really the, you know, the whole idea. And now we're coming up on, this is the 10 year anniversary. Uh, and like I said, it came by real fast. I'm excited for the cake smash that Justin says he's going to do in your face when you're not ready for it. <laughs> so happy 10 year anniversary. So that's that's be, with an actual cake. Don't yes. worry. Let's that's see <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was hardest. for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 